In the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus has just raised the bar to an impossible height. He's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Right before this, he's sat down and all those who are following him listen to him tell them you are blessed no matter what this world throws at you no matter how you feel if you are in the kingdom as citizens of god's kingdom you will be blessed he also says you are salt you're supposed to make this world delicious for others he says you're a light You are supposed to show my light so vividly that people are drawn to me. And then he says, and it's a verse not printed in here, right before our gospel starts, he says, but I tell you, there's always a but, right? But I tell you, if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never, never, no, enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh boy. And then he gives us this teaching that seems absolutely impossible. A teaching on anger, a teaching on lust, on divorce, and making promises. It's a huge, long list of things that sound like, you know, why, why even try? If the bar is so high. But he wants us to live the lives in the kingdom and understand that when jesus says if you're not if you're not living in if you're not doing these things you're not going to live in the kingdom he doesn't just mean that eternal life in heaven he means in the here and now he is talking about the kingdom life life lived in all its fullness life lived with full flourishing and joy right here and right now and he means that for us as well And what he's doing is talking about those things that compromise our relationship with God. And he's saying that even the very seeds of them, the very beginnings of anger and lust and divorce and not telling the truth or or embellishing, they can work against our relationship with God and with others. So I think what we'll do, since it's such a long list, we're going to concentrate on just the first teaching on anger. Because I think it's the most common, divisive thing that we deal with in our relationships in the church and outside the church. So, let's look at verses 21 on page 3 of your bulletin. Verses 21 through 22. Jesus said, you have heard it was said to those of ancient time, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you're even angry with somebody, or if you even call them a knucklehead, a fool, oh my gosh, you're liable to the fire of hell? What do we do with that? Well, Jesus, in this gospel reading, gives us a glimpse of the disease of spiritual sickness those germs that infect our lives, that can compromise our healthy relationship with God and someone else, the disease, and then he talks about the cure, and then he tells us what the power behind the cure. We hear what the power behind that cure is. So we have hope. The disease, the cure, and the power behind it. So we know the disease, everybody can say, yeah, I agree, murder is bad. We can all agree on that, right? But calling someone a doofus, I'm liable to the fire of hell? What's the cure for that? Well, Jesus tells those listening, if you're at the altar offering your gift and you realize as you're in the presence of God that maybe someone's angry with you or has a problem with you, then stop. Stop what you're doing. And then go. Go and do what? Go to the person. And, you know, today we might say, well, you know what, I'm cool because I can't think of anybody who's mad at me right now. So I'm all right. Scholars tell us that the best reading to put with this teaching is from Matthew 18. 
and it's Matthew 18, uh, 15 through 19. And I'm going to read a little bit about it, but what I would suggest is we take our bulletin home, look at this teaching, and then pull out your Bible and turn to Matthew 18 and look at verses 15 through 19. This talks about when we're mad at somebody or somebody has hurt us. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point it out the fault when just the two of you are alone. Notice it doesn't say, go and vent to somebody else. Right? I mean, how, how tempting is that? Go and vent to somebody else. No, it says, go and talk privately with this person and reconcile. Say, you know, this really hurt me. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. You're in relationship again. You are reconciled. But if he doesn't listen to you or she doesn't listen to you, take another person. And if he still doesn't listen or she doesn't listen, take the whole church. And what is he saying? If he doesn't listen to the whole church, the person who's hurting you doesn't listen to the whole church. Treat, does anybody remember this? Treat them as a tax collector and a Gentile. Yikes. Well, wait a minute. How did Jesus treat tax collectors and Gentiles. Just think for a moment. He spent time with them. He broke bread with them. He touched them when they were unclean. He healed them. He prayed for them. Oh no, we're not off the hook there either. What Jesus is telling the members of the church is, if someone won't listen to you, treat them even more tenderly. Spend your good time praying for them, praying for their healing. So my question today for all of us is, how do we know we're carrying around the germ that infects our spiritual life? You know, let's think of biology. All of us carry around germs all the time, don't we? And 99.9999% and of the time, they don't kill us or anybody else, right? Our immune system kicks them. Or they, we might just get a little bit sicker if we get, become weak, right? So how do we know we're carrying around the germs of anger or contempt or resentment? Well, we could do the Texas test. The Texas test is, have you ever heard yourself saying, bless his heart? He just tries so hard, but he, he doesn't quite do it. What's that? That's contempt, looking down your nose. You know, I have to look, watch out for myself. If I've been hurt repeatedly by someone, my question to myself is, what am I praying for? What am I rooting? Really, the word is rooting for. Am I rooting for everybody else to realize this guy's a jerk too? <laughs> you ever done that? You're not praying for their success and their turnaround, that everyone will love them. You're rooting that their true colors will come out, right? Yeah, it kind of, it's, it's a test to see, are we feeling a little bit sick? Because the minute the conditions are right and we become weak, those seeds of contempt, resentment, anger, they start to grow and take root and make us sick. And God says, leave your altar gift at the altar. Now, we might say, oh, that's, that's okay, you know, because I've got an altar right here. I just won't take communion this Sunday. I'll go reconcile. This is hard work. What Jesus was talking to Jews that were at one altar, the altar in the temple, and they had spent, an, most likely, the average person had spent a tremendous amount of time and energy and money to get that gift to the altar for sacrifice to be what? Made right with God. And Jesus said, that sacrifice doesn't mean anything until you sacrifice with forgiveness or apology. So how do we, what's the cure for all this? Jesus says it's reconciliation. Well, what does that mean? Does anybody know what etymology means? It means the root of a word. The root of the word reconciliation, concilia, in Latin means eyelash to eyelash. That's close, isn't it? So what Jesus is saying, you can't be really close seeing eye to eye with God unless you are eye to eye with your brother or sister. And that kind of Thing takes time and energy like Jesus was saying it takes intentionality it takes prayer it takes humility 
And it takes a willingness to live in community. In a time we are technologically connected and absolutely, in some cases, isolated from one another, the church is a weird place to be. Because we gather every week. Most people do not gather outside of work every week and fellowship. And we're together all the time. We're going to step on each other's toes, aren't we? As we live and worship and serve together. I think that's why I, one of the reasons I like mission trips is that for over a week, this past week I was in Honduras, for over a week, every waking hour we spent together. And every waking hour we spent working together to build churches alongside other Christians in the mountains of Honduras. You can imagine, you can imagine that it wasn't without conflict. It takes humility and the willingness to be in relationship and to talk about our conflicts and to work them out. In fact, it was hard because we were with people from a different culture who spoke a different language and did things differently. We had two construction guys on that trip and we were pouring, one of them was a concrete guy, and we were pouring the concrete for a church in the mountains. Do you know the amount of restraint it took that fella to not say, well, we don't do it that way? That's humility. And it takes deep listening to be brought together as Christians. He was, he listened to what they needed. He was obedient. And you know what? When we were finished with that floor of the church, it was beautiful. And those folks who worshiped there got exactly what God was calling them to build. But it takes humility and conversation and deep listening. Um, thankfully, it wasn't one of our group that didn't show that ability to depend upon someone outside their group and communicate with the folks working alongside them. But our bus driver, Carlos, he could hardly quit laughing when he was trying to tell us this story. He said another mission group had, um, when they came in, jumped on the bus and told Carlos, take us to a bakery. They didn't tell him why. They didn't ask for his help. He was the native speaker and knew the town. He said, all right, I'll go. And he took them. They filed off the bus, came with a big package, didn't tell him why, didn't tell him what they were doing. He said, now take us to the church. So they went for a worship service and invited him in, you know, come worship with us. We're going to have our opening communion together. Well, when the priest broke the bread, there was ham and cheese inside. <laughs> if they had just asked him to go in to the bakery with them, if they had been humble enough to know that we depend upon each other, that's what brings us together. That's what reconciles us. Humility and conversation. They, they made it through. They, they peeled the bread off and took communion, but, but it just shows you that communication and dependency on one another is absolutely essential for reconciliation. One of our newest members on the trip said she was trying to explain to her daughter on the phone what the trip was like, and she said, you know, it's like a family reunion with projects. And we hadn't even met some of these people before, but they were our brothers and sisters. And you can only be brothers and sisters with each other if you communicate in humility. And you know that the project you're involved in is God's project of redemption for all of us. So that's the cure, reconciliation, listening and humility. What is the power behind it? Because I don't think I have that power, do you? To forgive like that, to be humble like that, to be in relationship, to work through things, to be together, the power behind it all is the grace of God. The early Christian community immediately jumped into conflict because they lived together. Look on page two of your bulletin. Paul is talking to the Corinthians about divisions, about this seed of anger that is happening among the Corinthians they took even the best thing, which was evangelism, which was bringing each other to Christ, and started fighting over who was the best one, who was the best Christian. Down after, pay, after um, verse 3, for as long as there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another says, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? And this is where Paul says, it's not about you. 
It's about Jesus Christ and the grace of God. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but it's God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, a common project, and each will receive wages according to the labor for each. Wait a minute. Does that mean that we have to labor for God's favor, for a reward? Here's what Paul is saying. The reward is the labor. As each one of us fulfills God's call to us, and reaches out in love, depending on the grace of God and not claiming ourselves or somebody else, that labor lets us enter into the project of God, and that is the kingdom life. You are stepping in the kingdom when you do that. So as we get ready for Lent, let's read these two passages. Let's read the passage from, Mar uh, from Matthew 5. Let's read that passage 18, 15 through 19, and pray for God to reveal is there any bitterness, any anger, any germ running around in our spiritual life? Allow God to reveal that to us and then work together for reconciliation in that kingdom work. Amen.